Thank you, Susan, for agreeing to be interviewed or informally interviewed yeah. um, by Paul and Esther. Um, and thank you for putting your work up. It's really, really fits this space very well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for your interest. Mm -hmm. It's always fun doing work, but then you want others to look at it because <laughs> you're sharing it yourself and it's like having a conversation. Mm -hmm. And then if you can put it somewhere that's seen that it's like someone else is listening to you. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And that always I think I think one thing about five majors in this school is like the, the well I guess for everybody, you want to show work. It's very limited. Because you're excited. Yeah. Well for what you made it's kinda like well, wow. it's a bit like the little kid. Hey mama look. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. You know, so you have it at home and, and then it's folded up and put away. Yeah. So it's nice to pull it out and and have others yeah. enter enter into that friendship of sharing something. Mm -hmm. Most yeah. definitely. Yeah. The work is called um Renewal. Yeah. yeah. Um what is it about? What were you thinking when you were making it? Well, I really like going to nature. Mm -hmm. Um and being immersed with it around me, I'm very attracted to water, especially rivers moving or waves crashing. Or or a still lake where you get the mesmerizing patterns. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very attracted to texture and that's why I'm a fiber major. Mm -hmm. um, because when I see things in nature, I'm always thinking, how can I interpret that in fiber? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I like tactile, I like colors, um, how they merge and that uh, a leaf isn't just straight green, it'll be green merging into browns, you know, merging the yellows or the autumn leaves especially. Mm -hmm. But I find color fascinating, so I like when I paint, because I do painting, fiber and ceramics. Yeah. Um, so like for ceramics, I like how glazes, layering glazes and having them merge mm -hmm. and pull and unexpected results. And with painting, I like working from a palette that's got maybe my three primaries mm -hmm. or a version of them, depending on what I'm doing. But, and then I often paint, that one was painted with um, using an old credit card as if it was a palette knife. Okay, yeah. So I can smear the paint but not fully mix it. And then I'll work on layers. And it's built. At build. And then um, I keep coming in. So that's how I worked on creating the water mm -hmm. feel and in the sky and letting the under layers pull through mm -hmm. and creating un unexpected colors. And what I think is fascinating about that process is obviously with a credit card, I can't be detailed. Yeah. But yet, people would look at that and say, that's a very realistic painting. Mm. And it's your eye that is, your brain is interpreting um, the lights and darks, the shadows, mm -hmm. and saying, oh, that's uh, that rock, that's the underside of the rock. So I find the other exciting. So I guess in my artwork, I always am working for the, um, the unplanned elements. Mm -hmm. And in the tree bark, kind of tree pieces between, the, yeah. the nature scene, the painting. It's a fabric I make with, um, I'll wet the fabric, have a big piece on plastic, and then I'll use a sponge brush and have my colors. I might be thinking bark, so maybe brown, but I'm not thinking real brown. I'm thinking mixing my brown with some blue, with some red, with a touch of yellow. Um, maybe a little black, but not usually. Mm -hmm. uh, usually it's just more of the primaries, but in different amounts. Yeah. And then sponging, getting my wet sponge into it in different combinations, but then kind of going randomly on the, on, on the cloth and then keep adding water until I've used up all that's on my palette and, and rinse my brush out on the cloth too. So then I'll scrunch it and, and then put um, salt on it. So that one with the bark um, feel, I put it more in long mm -hmm. rows, and then the salt on it. And what happens when in the drying process, it's like magic because as whichever part of the cloth dries first, 
um, it will suck the moisture from the other part. So a top of a fold will dry first. Yeah. It'll suck the moisture from underneath, which means then the pigments get drawn apart and the tops of folds will get made into darker mm -hmm. um, because where the ridges are. And so that formed the bark pattern, which then I tore into widths that I could easily sew on the sewing machine. And then using a version of quilting, yeah. techniques with the body and um, I, I free stitched along the the lines up and down mm -hmm. and then I also use um, dryer dryer sheets yeah, yeah. I don't use them myself my daughter does and I salvage mm -hmm. I salvage anything that's free and around me yeah. or anything I'll say oh this is got a neat texture what could I do with it and I'll often wipe my palette with dryer sheets if I got extra paint from a painting and um, you can, when that's dried, you can tear it. So then I would match colors of tour and stuff and stitch them in too to give extra mm -hmm. texture on that one. So I'm combining texture and the free painting styles. And yeah. What a book. That, that's really, a really, seems like a really process driven yes. type of practice, type of mm -hmm. approach to, I guess you're inspired by nature and yes. Mm -hmm. That's where you draw the the ideas for your imagery, but it's also in the process of making that right. kind of decisions are being made. Right, right, and then and then when I see something I like, I kind of flow with it. Mm -hmm. But I'm never totally sure where it's going to go. And then for that one, it was a painting that I thought it was a wider painting, the nature scene. And then I thought, what would it look like? in sections maybe at first i was thinking of doing it around the box or something and then um so i ended up experimenting on my phone cropping it and yeah. i thought oh yeah you know so then i had to discover the ways of putting it in where i could stitch through it because it's done on a cloth but still the paint clogs the hole so then I for your machine to go through yeah. the needle. So how many layers? So that's why I put the matting around the picture and then I put the binding because the binding went on to mm -hmm. that's boring technical stuff. No, but but it's, I explore the processes and then I find I find out what works and then and then doing the different sections and, and I like to work random mm -hmm. and then say, okay, this is what I've got now, what will I do with it? Yeah. You know that um, the I guess it's because I'm an artist as well. Yeah. And like my interest being a fiber major also is in, in kind of heavily in technical. Like well one thing I really appreciated about your work. So two things. But I think they go in hand in hand are the choice you made of instead of doing just here in New York classic rectangular box frame kind of composition yeah. where it, it would just be a, a rectangle or something. You, you went the extra mile and laid out the composition in a way that was dynamic, mm -hmm. so that it almost flowed on the wall. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then, just from um, my observations, <laughs> again, how you installed it, like, it is not visible because it's just sitting there floating on the wall, but I just took a peek in the back. Yeah. And I was like, this is a very interesting way of putting this up. Mm. And so I, I just really appreciated the, the, the entire, oh, appreciate the entire way and approach that you go, went about it. It seems Fish. like a very, even though it might have been in the spur of the moment type of thing, it was yeah. decisions that were made. And then it's kind of, you run up to this next problem and, you sit and, and then you say which way forward. And often I get stuck and that's why I came out of school. Because I have a lot, all these pieces I've experimented with that I like the dye color, and then I say, but now what do I do with them? Mm. So I'm glad my fourth year is starting to maybe click into, okay, here's a way forward. Mm. I can tear them, work them in sections, and then I have the option of making them like a triptych, mm -hmm. or I can butt them up against each other. And even that way, I was, when I first hung it, I had a rod behind, but some fell forward. Ooh. So then this one, uh, but then I can float it way off the wall. Mm -hmm. So try to explore and so yeah, so I've got rings behind each section now that I can hook it on and it was very easy to put on. But yeah. You, so you have a fiber practice that's based in this, you know, inside of texture and color and experimentation. 
what, what happens in your painting practice and in your yeah. ceramics practice? That is it similarities going on there or similar ideas? Yeah, I think I think in all of them I approach it kind of like a child with play. Okay. Where you just say, "This is the material I have at hand," mm. and oh, I think it'd be fun to paint, and I might have an inspiration photo I've taken from in the mountains because mm -hmm. I really like the rushing water. Mm -hmm. And the rock and the texture of the rocks, and then I'll um, start working. And then what I like, I keep. What I don't, I layer more and more and more. Mm. And the ceramics, um, I'm into creating flowing organic shapes mm -hmm. and on the wheel. But then working, working them so much that the walls start collapsing. So then I do like a controlled collapse. Okay. So it's kind of like a like a drop of water, you know. So it's kind of floating like this kind of shape. Yeah. So I I, I love the shapes of curling leaves, mm -hmm. um, the dry leaves. I find that utterly fascinating. I love bark. I've taken far too many pictures of bark. <laughs> Just um, the like to take a photo of it up close and the intricacies. Like it's really it's a sculpture, mm -hmm. and um, so I think I in the summer camping and things like that, I immerse myself in nature, and and I'm hoping that my artistic statement comes out just in those flowing shapes. Mm -hmm. And that's so then when I create it, we, we were discussing this the other day, yeah. how then a critique is other people entering in and saying what it, what it reminds them of and how it speaks to, to you. And um, someone made a comment on a photo that had been posted, said um, your um, ceramic works look like they're growing kind of organic shapes and, yeah. and, and you're not quite sure what they're evolving into. And they're like a discussion point mm -hmm. for your imagination of what is it becoming. So I, 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 I like that, you know, not having um, too big of a artist statement. Like I, I choose materials based on what's cheapest and what I can use up. Mm -hmm. um, partly because, well, I think it's kind of funny that the generations have swung back to frugality and reusing, upcycling, <laughs> because that was my childhood. Because my parents, um, I was born in mid fifties, mm -hmm. so my parents' generation, when they were children, was the depression. Yes. So you didn't throw anything out. So my parents still had the remnants of that. Mm -hmm. So you know they maybe want you to wear used clothes and everybody want to have store-bought clothes and if it's handmade it was seen as less than yeah. because you couldn't afford to buy the real thing so your mother had to make it you know type of said almost disparagingly so i love it how your generation is honoring craft and honoring the skills that um kind of started to get despised a bit in the mm -hmm. 60s the 70s with the hippie movement um, they were there was a resurgence of craft and crocheting and sewing, um, and then it faded out again. But now it's come back in full force. So I love it seeing the students here. But so many of them are into in crocheting or like the fiber people. Yeah. It because it's tactile and there's so many creative ways you can make yarn go. Yeah. Yeah. So I so then I approach what do I have on hand. And so I'm not choosing the material based on what is it saying about the, the work, because I know that people like in sculpture here at the school mm -hmm. are trained like, okay, you use cement. Why did you use cement? That has a connotation to this, this, and that. Yeah. So I think as an artist, I want to be aware of those connotations mm -hmm. so that, and, but even, even me using upcycled sheets in the basic from what I'm painting on, for that fiber work that you took a picture of. Even me doing that is making an artist statement yeah. and saying, I don't think this should be just thrown in the landfill. But the, these um, discarded sheets from a hotel in Bath can be upcycled into art. Yeah. And what I, what I like for it as for me as an artist is it helps me to hit my stride because I'm not counting it, I, I'm not working with materials that are so precious that I can't afford to make a mistake. Exactly. In fact, I, I hit a new stride with painting with the credit cards 
just because I thought, okay, I want to make 10 paintings, but I, I don't want 10, but I want them big. And I didn't want to have 10 canvases because I can't move around my art room at home. And so I, so I tore up the sheet and then used this discarded household paint as my gesso layer, like I taped it to a big board. And then I had free canvas spot, you know, and then I just used whatever leftover acrylics I had from different tubes. Just created. And then, and then you could do painting after painting without sweating. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of like a similar idea that, well, not similar, but like in jewelry, they would work in brass or copper or some other material to 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 build skills and learn things about the practice. But I think what you're doing is a bit different in that you are embracing mm -hmm. whatever materials you have around and like creating beauty and creating something different out of them. And then and then whatever texture that thing has, then say, yeah. how can I use this and what would this look good? Does this tear? Does this mm. rip? And um, how does it take paint? Does it take dye? Um, mm. can, yeah, can it be distressed, heat distressed or, yeah. And then, and then oh, that's a cool texture. <laughs> what does that remind me of? Oh, that looks like moss or that looks like, and then to work it in. Well, what would you say is the, is the, at the moment, is or maybe in the past was was the most interesting material that you've used hmm. that has the most interesting effect that you've, you've found. Maybe. I th I think with with fiber has been the um, the painting or dye. If it's one hundred percent cotton or um, uh, natural fiber like silk, use acid silk dyes. But there's certain dyes that you can use on natural fibers. They bond right with the fabric. Whereas paint, acrylic paint, more sits on top, although you can add um, GAC 900 or something. There's, there's a medium you can add that'll help it to mm -hmm. um, soak into your material more. But um, if your fabric, and the sheets that got donated were uh, had polyester in them, Mm -hmm. So the cotton and polyester, which means the dye doesn't bond to the polyester. So that means it, it's an effect because maybe the, the polyester um, threads are going vertical and the others are going horizontal, so it'll pick up different yeah. ways. But it'll be muted compared to what a dye or a procyon dye would be like on it. Um, but so then I can get that dye effect of it merging and swirling by using wet cloth to discover that technique mm -hmm. and then and then the, the bunching it and having it super wet and watching it dry it's it's like watching a photo develop so I, I even get up in the night sometimes like oh, I don't know what's happened and then I'm so tempted to lift it because the reverse will be different where the paint of the water might have pooled underneath or an air bubble will create effects which if it's flat yeah. it will be super cool too or if you throw on uh, scrunched up um, plastic. Oh you know? yeah. Yeah. So that yeah. And then I love I love I love um, the tactileness of clay too. Just mm -hmm. feeling to shape something with your hands. Yeah. It, yeah. It's soothing to me. <laughs> it's meditative. Yeah. I think, especially being on the wheel if it's flowing on. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it's frustrating. <laughs> I know you're not graduating this in this year, yeah, no. this academic year, but I, I don't know if you've had any thoughts about like what are you going to do outside of this institution? You know, when how you how are you going to approach your practice then? What what is your interest you think will be what's going on? There? I um, I think I'll just wait and see how it develops, but um, I think I came back to art school, like, because I had a, a degree in psychology mm -hmm. at the end of the 70s. And then I spent my life raising children, our own, and then I worked in a boarding school, in an international school in Kenya for 10 years, mm -hmm. with my husband as a PE teacher. And it was for international people working with NGOs in Kenya, mm -hmm. so they could come back to North America and get their kids into North American schools. Um, so we did that, and then I worked at, with foster care for 25 years too, and um, we ended up adopting. Um, I love children, so we've got six kids. So basically, I 
invested. That was mainly my life, and I like I like I like working with kids. And you can do crafts. You can do all sorts of stuff. Um, and so, but doing creative things and then merging into painting after fiber. Um, it was my way of um, carving a little time for sanity. <laughs> if things are really, you know, kids do stress you out. Okay, I'm not going to say it was all. It's my first love, but it's not my own, you know. Okay. And, and, and creating is always like, as a little kid, I was always making something. Yeah, with sewing and creating, you know. So, so I've always used um, and been into it. And it's just maybe even since the summer that I've kind of come out as an artist, like because I've been making stuff and it's hiding in all my rooms or showing sales. Yeah. But it's more quiet. Like I would never say to my friends, "I'm an artist." Kind of like mm. it, it's because you're putting yourself out there, yeah. and for people to say, "Oh, you think you're an artist," <laughs> or you think they might be thinking, "Like, gosh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm older, but you still you still have those moments of." Wondering what people how, and because there's so many different levels. Like, are you creating for the art school, which wants something like an outfit for the runway versus streetwear? Mm -hmm. You know what exactly. I mean? They want something out of the box. They want it really radical. Whereas my peers are like, okay, what kind of stuff are you? <laughs> you know what I mean? And they appreciate my most traditional stuff. Okay. Whereas the school of the bar, you know, not like, contemporary. Yeah. So you know, so you, you you're navigating between. The art market, older generations, younger generations, and like the galleries type mm -hmm. thing. So uh, that could be frustrating being at school, being pushed into another like more more random stuff that that part of you saying, why would I want to make that? Yeah. But then you jump at a challenge, and then you think, oh my gosh, I never thought I would get into this. Mm -hmm. Like painting in layers was one. One assignment in painting class, we had to paint something, and then then she said you had to pick, take pictures six six different layers of totally different directions. Mm -hmm. So like jump in, and put a bottom layer down, then matter what colors, jump in again, and maybe you're going to do some line work, and then jump in again, and and, and then what I found was that it was utterly fascinating all the layers peeping through. Mm -hmm. And it just added a whole other dimension. I would never have gotten there without the stupid assignment that I thought was garbage at the beginning. But then, after I did the first one, I'm like, wow. And then I started doing a whole bunch. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm glad I'm here, and I'm understanding artistic statements, um, presenting your work, and stuff like that. So, if I get a chance to do shows, or be seen here or there, or be in a gallery, who knows? But I guess I, I was saying I've got I've become more visible since the summer because mm -hmm. one of my sons, of um, my six kids, the one who's most into technology, said, "Mom, you've got to get on Instagram. <laughs> I want to see a post a day." You know, so he's like, he kept bugging me, and then he was my coach. <laughs> so then I, yeah, so I'm on Instagram and uh, Susan Mary Mitchell dot art, yeah. and, and and you know, so then it's uh, yeah, it's a dream. So you don't know one opportunity leads to another, to another. Mm -hmm. But it, it's it's being courageous and just say going out there. It's like it's like being an actor and you just say, okay, I'm out on the stage. Mm -hmm. Everybody stares at me or my work, and everybody's going to have a judgment whether they think I did a good job acting or not. Mm -hmm. And people might understand, might they might not. They might prefer a different style. And you have to just uh, maybe maybe being in art school helps you develop a like whatever <laughs> attitude because you know you'll have within the same day someone will say oh I love that something you did and someone else so you'll just get the feeling like it wasn't enough mm. it, it didn't push it, it did, you know and so you're like <laughs> you know so then you just you, then you start making art for yourself that you like but yet being aware of your audience. Yeah. And, but understanding audiences and understanding what audiences respond to different things. That's, that, that's, that's I think, that's a key thing. Like, you know, I, I have my own critiques of the academic institution. Um, but as one thing, you know, it's whilst take lectures and the curriculum, whatever, will push you in one direction. And, you know, like, John Popek will, yeah. will appreciate another direction. Right. It's, it's all about the audience and who you're catering it to. And like, 
And it's hard for my practice that being genuine to myself. Yeah. But then also being aware of these other things around me, you know, can help me to, you know, make decisions as to okay, maybe this piece would be more traditional. Right. This piece right. And and this person's more interested in that, and this one, like uh, in um, um, my husband and I are retired, so he likes to go to Puerto Vallarta in the winter, mm -hmm. and so um, that's why the last winter too, I've taken off to go down there, but I get to do ceramics there, and mm -hmm. there's visiting people from across the states or Canada and, and so there's like a, a studio that we can pay studio rates. So there'll be some Mexicans, some across the states, some Canada. And you see different people's ways of working on the clay yeah. or whatever. But um, because I'm there, I don't want to carry it all home. And I can't. And then I just kind of went to town and really was making <laughs> far too many for being able to process them and take yeah. them. Um, so some a man who has a, a home decor mm -hmm. kind of high end decor store, um, he he would buy from some of the artists. So I heard that. So then um, I was very thankful that he bought some of my pieces mm -hmm. and put them in his store. But he actually has three stores. One is for the home for like sometimes people who buy an apartment. Well, ask him to curate and and, okay. and and do the house finishings for it, yeah. the, right through. So he'll do the curating. So for the house home decor, and then he has a store with product there, and then he has another one that's geared for the tourist market, which is smaller pieces that people buy. And, they to get show. and then he has a third place, which is an art gallery. Oh, so yeah. he he was looking at my stuff <laughs> and he said, "This one we go for this one." For the tourist store, though, I, I'd need it to be more small along this, this, and that. But he knew what people would buy on each of those markets. Mm -hmm. And I guess as artists, um, you have to be aware of your art, your your audience, because we want to create. Yeah. But we don't want to be sitting in a house full of... <laughs> like, we, we can't move out of it with all the stuff that yes. we have that nobody really wants. You can't create if it's surrounded by already created. Right. And so you, <coughs> you need an outlet. Yeah. Where's it going to go? Who's, who's interested in it? So you have to be aware of your audience and you have to be aware of the market. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. But you still want to be true to yourself in those different ones. Yeah, it's, 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 it's almost a. And not, not that you're compromising you know, your vision or your beliefs or anything like that, but it's more so. As a life, it's more complicated than this is what I want right. and I can do. And maybe it's the formatting. Yeah. Like, like, um, like at the school, the fiber pieces that you were kind of helping me hang up the other day. Mm -hmm. and, and it was very lightweight and you're, we were suspending it so it could flow. Now, that would, would go great for an art gallery. Yeah. But most people don't want stuff floating in their house. <laughs> no, they want yeah. behind you something know. to protect it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I can make that work and for the art gallery, hang it in a creative floating atmospheric way or whatever, but then for the show and sale at the school, I might be aware that my, my audience might want to see it um, in a frame, yeah. again, for a walk, so that I can do some pieces like that too. It's all about that formatting is a very good point. I also like the story about um, Mexican gentleman. I, I, think, I think that that's a great business mind right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then he saw certain certain ones. He said, no, maybe we'll come next year to have a, a series of this, this one on the fiber and we'll put it back. I'd like to see it with backlit. You know what I mean? And then, you know, if I entered that way and if I was fortunate enough to get his attention and he liked it, he, he puts on shows regularly and he features an artist. So, you know, stuff like that. So where will I go? Maybe I'll get opportunities like that. Who knows? Opportunities in the era. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. My last question for you is: Is there is there something, a project, or a piece of work, or a bit of experimentation that you're working on right now that that you're really excited about and you wouldn't mind sharing? Okay. Um, while in one of my classes, I, I, I did a trip, just back to, I did a trip to China where I have one son who lives there and um, he was getting married. So we did a trip last spring mm -hmm. and um, 
I bought, I don't know, about 10, 16 yards of silk mm -hmm. at a silk market. So in one of my classes, it's a self-directed project. So I'm um, tearing them in different sections and using different types of dyes create, as to create wearable art. Mm -hmm. Because that's another way you can market your stuff. Yeah. Because you and, and so I can use some of those free-flowing techniques, but on silk, and then form them into scarves, loose flowing capes type of thing. So that that creates an outlet for your stuff, mm -hmm. but also gives you the fun of saying, "Ooh, I wonder what this color combination." And then just yeah, 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 I work I work fast and messy, and then but then love the spontaneous results, and then I and then so if I can make them into scarves or shawls and, mm -hmm. and um, asymmetrical pieces or whatever. So yes, I'm excited about that. Yeah, I'm excited to learn about how many classes you have had as a fashion. Yeah, yeah. And I'm excited about those as well. Yeah. So it would be cool to see how they develop over this semester. Yeah, well thank you. Um, thank you so much for agreeing to the interview again and for sure I do. Holy Thanks very much, John. <laughs>